Gloria a Dios. Gloria a Dios mismo. Glory to God. Very good. Yes. Okay. Do you remember this song? Yes. What's that? Is it? Let me see a little higher. Mary, Mary, her soul, 
Well, and this is not stone. Peter and Mary from the Bible, right? No, it's, it's just a name. Mm -hmm. from the Lord. It's like when we when we came to the house of the Lord, come, there is people with sadness, there is people so joyful. There is well, even though you think also we can apply to Mary, you know, the Magnificat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I thinking of Mary Peter, when yeah. he was under persecution trial. Yeah. So and it has layers of meaning. <laughs> and then Esperanza is another name, hope. We brought faith and we brought our, our hearts. So then we came to the house of the Lord to gather. And then the other slide was says this says that we can be edified, uh, comfort, free, uh, uh, free, free. Free. Want me to translate it? Yes, please. please. Free in his house, I will be free. Consult. There is consolation in his house. Blessed, I will be blessed in his house. Okay, so I will try to teach you the, the melody of the chorus. You can sing with me, and then I will sing the solos. Yeah. Dancing is allowed in this. In this, one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a kind of a Cuban genre called song. Song. With,
Oh, they don't have one. Oh, yes, sir.
Well, I hope someday we will be able to see the music of this song. I think that would be beautiful and these two other congregations. So is there any possibility in the future you will write? Or, you already have the music there. Yes. Can we have Jeremy? copies? Of course. Yeah, she will be so nice. But they're beautiful, beautiful songs written by someone who really has experience, the love of God. Okay, let's go back to our subject of worship. We'll be reviewing um, what the Bible says about worship. Here is adoración in tiempos bíblicos. At the beginning, worship was done in four. Do you remember Cain, Cain and Abel? Yes. Now, this passage is very, very interesting because God accepts the offering of uh, Cain, remember? Or it was Abel. Who was the one he accepts? Abel. Exactly. And one was a fruit offering, right? And the other was? An animal lamb. Why does God accept the animal sacrifice and he doesn't, he, he doesn't accept the fruit? Do you think he was not vegetarian? Uh, no. He gave the best uh, friend. He gave his best. The best. So I want to think this because it has to do with life. Life. Okay, very good. Lamb, life. And really. In order to have a lamb ready for sacrifice, you have to spend a lot of time taking care of it. Well, same with fruits, I would say. Yeah. But maybe fruits is just a matter of, especially at that time, they didn't have to grow vegetables and organic and all these things that we talk about <laughs> these days. It was just a matter of go to an apple tree or not, a banana. They have bananas there, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it was his, yeah. I, I somehow got the idea that he gave his seconds. No. Not the good okay. Stuff. So I don't know where I got that idea, but I was taught that Cain gave, um, he didn't have his heart right to God. He yes. just brought something. He was upset with, um, with God for favoring Abel in the first place. Okay. And remember, at that time, to sacrifice a lamb cost a lot of money. Yeah. Don't you think so? And we were talking with Yvette, uh, oh, thank you. Yvette during a uh, lunch that in Cuba. When children, we have a, a piece of bread for breakfast, right? They won't have a snack to, to take to school. They have to decide. I will eat this piece of bread for breakfast, or I will eat this bread to the school. So, so I'm thinking here the same, because it says um, uh, Genesis 4, 3 and 4, it says, um, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain's and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. See, we see several things here. The attitude. What happened when uh, Cain realized that his offering is not being accepted? Angry, see? The attitude had come, you know, my offering was not accepted. And so we see that um, Abel offered the best, the firstborn. He did, you were saying about your offering the best things, uh, you know, the, something that really, really put value. Okay? And sometimes, and I confess myself, they say when you are uh, going like this, you are responsible. See how many fingers are pointing to me. So every time I preach a while, I say, well, I'm the first one that need to recognize this. Because a lot of times, we don't give the Lord our best, see? For example, I'm mm -hmm. a pianist, and I spend a lot of hours, you know, well, yeah, used to, not now, but when I was born performance, I spend a lot of time practicing my piano, and I like to practice, you know, my, the best time of the day, I decided to practice. Now, prayer and devotion. If I remember, I will leave this at the very end of the day when I was so tired. And a lot of times, really, the best time of our life we don't dedicate to God. So really, when I see young people like Yvette and others, really, my heart really moves because I say these people are offering the best years. I've heard a lot of testimonies from adults. They say, oh, I wish 
in my youth day, I could serve the Lord. So that's why it's a tremendous opportunity for young people really to dedicate their lives because they're offering the best. Okay, we need to keep on. There's so many things to talk about worship, but this is the first example of worship in the Bible. Noah, you remember this? You know, Noah's Ark? <laughs> By the way, in my country, Guatemala, we have a church called Noah's Ark. That's the name of the church. Noah's Ark Baptist Church. And people kill them because they say they come to the church in couples. <laughs> <laughs> Only couples are allowed to this church. <laughs> But it's true that the church is called Noah's Ark. The idea is salvation. We're offering salvation to everybody, that's what they call it. But Noah had this experience. So I'm saying that at that time, they didn't have a specific place to worship. Right? For example, Noah, when the flood is over and they go out, then they offer a sacrifice. We read this in the Bible, Genesis 8.20. Abraham, we have several examples of Abraham uh, worshiping God. Isaac, Berseba. So every time they have an experience with God, they, they build an altar and they worship God right there. See? So it was not a matter of finding a place to worship, but where they have this encounter with God, then they uh, build an altar. There are several uh, scripture references about this idea of building altars. Very informal, really, we don't know really what type of worship they had. There was uh, liturgy. Remember at that time they didn't have the Psalms, for example? Right? They didn't have all these wonderful New Testament canticles like the Nicky and all this. But we know that they worship God. Now comes the idea of having a specific place, the tabernacle and uh, Sabbath, the day of uh, rest. And in Exodus, we Jacob in Egypt, and they, the people of Israel, crossed the <coughs> Red Sea. By the way, there's some movements among evangelicals, even pastors, they're trying to explain in scientific terms miracles. And I was playing in the church where the pastor, a lady pastor, in the sermon, she was talking about, oh, God uh, doing the multiplication of bread and fish. And she said, well, Really, she said, the way I understand is that at that time, everybody took a bread and fish when they go on these trips. And she was explaining. She said, uh, this little boy brought, you know, two pieces of, these two fishes in, well, whatever. He brought a bre bread and fish, and God miracles will multiply. She said, well, the thing is when people saw that he offered what he had, everybody opened their eyes with their lunches, and that's why everybody had enough to eat. So she was trying you know, to deny Jesus doing a miracle. And I won't mention the name of the denomination that she will to, but this, there's a movement I'm trying to explain in physical terms. Talking about the Israel passing the Red Sea, some people say, you know what? At that time of the year, there is a lot of wind, very strong winds in this part of Israel. There was a, a sandstorm, and the sandstorm produces for the Red Sea to open, and then the people went uh, past. See? See, it's not really God. It was just nature. So I hope the church is going there for teaching this kind of thing. Because if we deny the power of Jesus, power of God, we'd be like going to a, a, a lions or any kind of social club, right? And some churches, unfortunately, are came in this direction. But anyway, after they pass the Red Sea, uh, we have an act of worship. And ladies, this is important for you. Who was, who was the first lady that led worship? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that was Moses' sister, right? Yeah. Miriam. She's the one who led the congregation. Mm -hmm. This, please, oh, we're recording this. I don't know about the This is a seminary where I teach. They don't believe in women uh, in ministry. Mm -hmm. The seminary I teach, they're not allowed women to read the Bible in public. <laughs> so this is really going to the extreme. But we have an example of a, a woman leading worship. And uh, she used the tambourine, and it probably was a wonderful act of worship. So this is another reference. Um, then uh, God, Jehovah, reveals you know, the Mount Sinai. And then he has the, the commandments. 
And then the Shema in the term, I don't know how to pronounce this in English. It's easier for me in Spanish, Deuteronomio. In English would be? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. It's even difficult in English. <laughs> but anyway, if you have a Bible, read this because this is very important. Jews still today, they use this uh, part of the Bible in the services. Every time they meet for, for service, for worship. So who can read this, the Shema? Or recite this from memory, if you know. So that was one of maybe the first elements that the uh, Jews took for the worship. And still, you go to a Jewish temple, you will hear uh, people or the rabbi or whatever they call it to repeat this sentence. And then in Exodus 25, 8, we have the uh, building of the tabernacle. That's the first time that there is a specific place to worship. Who can tell me something about the tabernacle? How was it built? How was the meaning of the tabernacle? Was it something that they can move from place to place? Yeah, it was a portable. What else do you know about the tabernacle? Colorful. Eh? Colorful. Colorful, okay. What else do they have in the tabernacle? The ark, exactly, the ark of the covenant. Have you seen this movie? Uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's an action movie, of course, you know, it's exaggerated. But some people are still looking for the Ark. And I feel sorry for these people, you know. They think if they find the Ark, they will have powerful uh, spatial powers and things like that. They don't have anything else to do. Okay. Um, in Canaan, the first place to worship God is mentioned in Joshua 424, and the place is called Gilgal. We have further tabernacle, and then when the people are in Israel, when they finally get to the promised land, they, they have this uh, place to worship. David, we were talking about David, he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And remember what David did when he brought the Ark? Remember this passage? But he did it when he brought the Ark. When he was dancing. Dancing. That's why we can dance in church. See, some people are saying that, that's a justification. Now, I'm really looking forward, I'm attending, I think it's tomorrow morning, they're doing a workshop on how to use dance with children in the church. And since I work with children, I'm so interested. I teach a lot of uh, folk dances from around the world with the children that I teach. Uh, I teach a funny song, cute song about from Africa, Fanga Lafia. But we're from Africa here. If I see Fanga Alafia, Ashe, Ashe, Fanga Alafia, Ashe, 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 It's a welcome song, right? Fanga Alafia. So when I teach this to kids, they love to go. And also I teach uh, dances from uh, Hebrew. Different dances from all the world. But I'm interested to see how can we use dance with children in worship. There's a seminar tomorrow. But anyway, what, what is you uh, thinking about using dance in church services? You think it's appropriate? We, they are dressed appropriately, yes. If it's appropriate, you say it's appropriate. The dress is appropriate. In all the dress, you're talking about the dress, okay? Yes. There won't be uh, calling attention to the dancer. Yes. Okay? <laughs> Have you seen there's the only Christian ballet company that I know, that I'm familiar with, is called Magnifica. They're based in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But this is the only Christian ballet company I know that they do Christian uh, dance. And they, it's, it's one of their professional ballet dancers. Now, it's interesting. David danced, that's true, but it was not in the temple. Mm -hmm. See? Yes. yes. See, for this culture, dancing was, uh, for example, when someone gets married, if uh, you have something very happy in your family, something happy in your family, very happy, then you start dancing. But it's nothing, nothing that they rehearse. It was very spontaneous. So this time is. Now, so talking about dancing in the church, how could that be related to worship and praising? Okay. Talking about worship in the church, yeah. if you are 
probably a member of the church, uh -huh. and you're dancing to this song that's uh -huh. yeah. said, uh -huh. I mean, you're not doing it from your heart, you're doing it because of the music you want to <laughs> dance to. Yeah. So how can that be, you know, encouraged? Yeah. Is it going to be something religious or is something um, traditional or, you know? Every time we do music, we play, we sing, there is a physical response. Mm -hmm. There's an intellectual response, but it's a physical response. That's why, you know, music that has a rubbery one. So, do you think I can see this like this? The intent is to move. And people even go like this. I, mean, I always observe, you know, what people do in, in churches. I think they got this maybe from rock concerts. They don't do this. When you go to a rock concert, you don't see chairs. Everybody's standing. Now, that's my own theory. When I grew up, everybody sat and uh, sing. Uh, they sang sitting when I grew up. Nowadays, you have immediately, it's like it's mandatory to stand when you're singing. <laughs> now I have my own theory. It's not a law <laughs> yet. My theory is that uh, they took this idea from rock concerts. Because in rock concerts, everybody stands. Have you done a little bit to a rock concert? Or have you watched it? Have you reached it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. Because this music, you know, calls for, for moving. If I go to a, a concert to listen to uh, Beethoven, well, sometimes even classical music you know, has so much rhythm, but you're not supposed to move because it's classical music. Mm -hmm. But rock is OK. So <laughs> I think uh, dance is a physical response to music. That's true. Have you ever danced something with no music? Mm, it's going to be difficult. It would be kind of difficult. There's no music. There's the movement. So. Because music and dance yeah. goes together. So I would say you have to be careful with how we to First, to pray. Mm -hmm. I think God can give us wisdom. Don't yeah. you think so? Wisdom and common sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, common sense. Mm -hmm. For example, if the church is, um, there are many people that really will be offensive to them to start moving. Mm -hmm. If I do this, I will be a stumbling block for the church. Yes. I will be edifying the community. So I don't see anything wrong with dancing. Because really, what is dancing? It's just you know, using physical gestures you know, to express something. Now, I like dancing or creative movement, they call it. Baptist circles, we never dance. We say creative movement. <laughs> sounds better. But I've seen, for example, um, they're singing the Lord's Prayer. And some I start doing the movements that go with the words. Are you familiar with this city? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be. One time I saw a person, who was a man, and he was doing some movements, but it was a dance a choreography to the Lord's Prayer, but it was so meaningful. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times what we see, we call dances in churches, I call this more aerobics. Yeah. We would, which I think is fine, you know? For example, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When I dance the floor, uh, I don't call this a dance. You know, it's just a spiritual exercise. Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. So I think we have to differentiate what really what is dance in church, what is creative movement, and what is just moving to the. So then I get to go back to where yes. we started this morning, uh -huh. talking about um, division in the church, right? Um, say, for example, you have a congregation of probably 800 members. And amongst the 800, you have probably 250 maximum. You know, don't let this shouting ends in the church. They want to be solemn, worship God, and pray, you know. It's the way to go. And so if this is a church that beats the drum and play the guitar and everybody dancing and running all around to show, I don't want to be a part of that, so I want to go, you know. So if, if this, this church decides, that, look, we're going to have two services. <laughs> One in the morning, those who don't like the dancing, you come. One hour, 30 minutes, you get, you go home. Yeah. The other people who like the dancing and shouting and yeah. you know, running yeah. around, the tradition. you can come for how long you want to be here. Um, uh, I, I want you to tell me, how, how, how is that um, much of a division in the church or um, amongst Christians, yeah. so to speak? You know? um, uh, because you don't want it, and I want it. We're still existing as brothers and sisters, yeah. but what you like, I don't like it. All right, like you talk about kneeling to pray. 
I will sit and talk to God as you know, as so as I can. Mm -hmm. But you will want to kneel and feel it is more of reverence and stuff like that. So I mean, I think that's why worship leaders, pastors, especially, we want to talk about the role of pastors in worship service. For me, the the one who is responsible for worship to the church mm -hmm. is the pastor, not the priest. Mm -hmm. Not the music. Exactly. The pastor. The pastor guide the whole congregation. I will say, uh, if you are a worship leader, you lead a uh, service. They were, uh, give them freedom. Give them choices. Okay. For example, but I can I think we have to be, use common sense. For example, for me, the Crystal Cathedral. You are familiar with Crystal Cathedral in California, Pastor Schuler? They used to have a TV program. For me, that was an ideal service. In the same service, they have an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And they will sing an anthem by Handel or Mendelssohn, very classic. Next will be a jazz uh, group playing completely different style. Mm -hmm. And then they will sing a, a song. And then they will have, in every service, they will, you will see like three or four different musical styles. For me, that's ideal because in every congregation there's some people that like some type of music. If, for example, maybe you like pizza better than hamburgers, but you love uh, Italian food, for example. <coughs> so I, as a worship leader, I should uh, my responsibility to you know to provide, not necessarily that making people happy all the time. <coughs> kids, kids, they love to eat ice cream right, all the time. How about if we give them ice cream? Three times a day. Mm. <laughs> so I think with congregation that like this, a very live or very colorful. Uh, what are the words that we used to describe? Yeah, it was contemporary. Don't you think these people that love to sing this uh, song that we beat and we beat? I think we should give them opportunity to sing one hymn that is completely different that make us to think, you know, part of the theology, part by the verse is this uh, song based. Same time, for congregation of very tradition, always open the hymns. Mm -hmm. I think it will be good, we will refresh it, to show you know the words on the PowerPoint, maybe use electronic instruments. Yeah. So I think pray, uh, common sense, uh, knowing the culture of the congregation. If you want to introduce changes, you have to go with it. Mm -hmm. I've seen favors of people. For example, the church I attended when I was uh, going to school in Oklahoma, they decided to have uh, two services. And they got away with choir robes, no children's choir, the thing of the past. We did a praise team, professional singers. Which is sad. No handle, but they have professional musicians. And they wanted, but they did this like, in like a month. All these changes. And they let people bring their cup of coffee inside the, the, the building. Because they wanted to have very informal, they didn't want to offend. If you want your coffee at 8 30 in the morning, bring it to the church. So for me, for me it was kind of offensive. Because you know, for me, when I go to the service, for me this is a place where God's presence is, is revealed. So how about I'm drinking coffee? You know, when I'm worshiping God. But so one of the you, know, you know why I asked the question? Uh -huh. um, we, we started this morning with um, the topic was um, division in the church. Yes. Someone talked about um, uh, two services bringing about the um, division amongst Christians in the church. Um, um, uh, for where I come from, Liberia, um, the first United Methodist Church, of the small church, and, um, very traditional. Because the missionaries brought a exactly. format. Exactly. Third So as time you know changes, you find out that um, not only did the war took a, a lot of people out of the country, they got mixed up with other um, you know, and so coming back home, coming to your home church, you probably want to practice what you learn out there. And so um, it was like um, there was a praise thing, full service time. Even though there is an order. And the traditional instruments, the exactly. exactly. power of drums and bass. Yeah. And so it started to beat the drum and sing praise songs, wow. people dancing and stuff like that. And there were some there who were like, oh no, 
and what are you trying to do? You're trying to change things around here. We don't like this. You know, it's harder to bring about problems. So then um, there was a committee set up to um, pray about it, um, see how best this could work out, if it was going to be possible for two services. Um, it's a congregation of 3,000 plus students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so because of that, you had um, a good number, close to 800 persons, who liked the drum, who wanted to dance and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, OK, we're going to have two services. We're going to try for the first month. Mm -hmm. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, we will continue. But then, if we should continue because it doesn't work, what happens to those who want it? Where are they going? You know, that was the question. And it was like, OK, they will leave and go to the charismatic churches and dance. So um, I mean, the committee did well. Now we have two services. Those who want to drum and those who want to dance, they come to the service by 7.30 in the morning, all right? And they do all they want, even though there is an order, there is preaching, and the scene, you know, all the worship, you know, or the afternoon service, the full service. Um, carry out as mm -hmm. early as that. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, people from the second <coughs> service now have started going to the first service. Not only because of the dancing and stuff, but because they want to get in early and even go oh, home. And so they have one way or the other, you know, kind of welcoming this situation. I mean, it's um, out of worship one way or the other. And so it's like everybody together. I haven't seen division. I haven't seen anyone from the second service, you know, discussing those that go to the first service and discrediting their, their um, worship. Nobody in the first service, you know, kind of discrediting. So uh, when we were talking this morning, uh, the vision came in, and I'm like, uh, you know, uh, this is something that is happening at my church. But instead, we are more together than you know, ever before. Okay. And, and there are a lot of activities, because if the first service worshipers decide to have a revival, I mean, it's going to be in the evening time, and sometimes for three, four days, you find the entire congregation coming. And whatever they do there is not seen like Sunday morning worship service, but it's a revival. And so everybody participates. And I, 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 I've, I've seen great change, you know, uh, with the coming in of the two services at my church. It hasn't brought in any division. Well, one would say that it doesn't matter what we're doing in services, we should ask people what. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we're dancing just because we like to move and we're responding to the music, mm -hmm. maybe there's something wrong them because really they're, they're, because they're moving so much, they don't have time to think, to meditate what they're singing about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing, if you just sit, you know, like a statue, or move, but your mind go, goes to so many directions, I don't think really we are fulfilling the, the purpose of singing songs. Right. So why don't we ask people to reflect? For example, when I'm leading songs, what I do after we sing, I ask the congregation, what were we singing about? What scripture verse can you relate to the song that we were singing? Because then people are forced to say, okay, we're doing this because. Or I will ask, why don't we sing an invitation hymn at the beginning of the service? Do you think we can sing an invitation hymn at the beginning of the service? Yeah, why in the Bible doesn't say? But, you know, after the sermon we use music, you know, to reinforce, to magnify, you know, that the invitation, that's why we sing certain songs. But we need to um, encourage our congregations to think. Right. If we're dancing, we're moving quiet, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, very good. Thank you for your participation. Um, and then comes the temple. The temple is start very elaborate, and you use the word colorful. Yes, and the temple was very colorful, very artistic. If you read uh, all chronicles, you will see all the details. God, you know, really, he, he's an artist. He's a supreme artist. Because he loves art, he loves aesthetics. And if you read how the temple was supposed to be built, you will read everything was detailed. The colors, the different uh, costumes, the robes of the priests. For example, if you read, everything has a special meaning. So now comes a very elaborated service. There is, of course, nobody has a camera at that time, digital camera. This is a reconstruction of the temple of Jerusalem. Uh, and it was a very elaborate uh, service. What were some of the elements in the service of the temple? What they were doing as part of the service? Have you read? Mm -hmm. did, they, did they sing? Yeah. 
sacrificing was very important in the temple. They sang. What kind of songs they sang? Yeah. yeah, exactly, songs. Do they pray in the temple? Yeah. yeah. Now, what is very important that there was just one group of people that led the congregation, people in worship, who the tribe of Levi. Levites. Mm -hmm. See, at that time, right now, I heard people say, oh, God is calling me to music ministry. Have you heard these testimonies? Mm -hmm. But at that time, you were not born in a special tribe to be a unit minister. There was only one tribe. And what is interesting, you realize this for musicians, that's the beginning of, you, uh, of the concept that musicians in church needs to be paid, no volunteer. At that time, these Levites, they just work for the temple. Mm -hmm. They train choir members, they train musicians, instrumentalists. So they didn't have to work. They didn't have to uh, work in the fields or taking care of the sheep. Where was their income coming from? For members, members were to make, make uh, paying to them. To the offerings, yeah, offerings, yeah. exactly. Remember when people brought offerings to the temple, they were supposed to have you know, a portion of this. But when God gave every tribe a piece of land, Everybody gives some properties, but the Levites. This is very important. Yeah. You don't like this one. <laughs> one time I was doing a conference of this, and the musicians were so happy. Oh, you need to preach to our churches that they need to give us some offering. You know, they say, it's biblical that we should be paid. And then when I talk about the Levites couldn't buy property, couldn't be owned, they say, oh, we don't like this part of, of the Bible. But anyway, so temple was very elaborate. Orchestras, big part of orchestras, symbols and all kind of instruments that you read in the Bible. Sacrifice, you read the basic sacrifices. Posture of, of worship, reverence. For example, when the high priest, remember, every, once a year, he went to the holy of the holy places. And then everybody bent down. See? So there were some physical um, gesture positions uh, regarding to, to worship. The service uh, consisted of musical instruments, solos, <coughs> choirs, uh, instrumentalists. When you read the Psalms, have you seen this word? <coughs> when you read the Psalms, have you seen this word? Yes. Yeah. So, there are many interpretations. I've heard so many interpretations. I would like to talk to some of the specialists here about the thing about this word self. Some people think there was like an interlude. So people were singing the psalms and then just the instruments play. So people could reflect, they could meditate. This is one interpretation. One interpretation maybe was an instrument. Other people they say it was a scale, a mode that they, they sang the psalms. I don't think really nobody knows for sure what it was said. But we know that they, they use a lot of instrumental music. Uh, they pray, uh, of course. There is another uh, reconstruction of a sacrifice. Now, the temple was uh, built to teach the permanence of God, the centrality of God. And remember, the temple was not used only for worship and for sacrifices, it also was used for national assemblies. So, when they had no, uh, no election, they didn't have election. But they wanted to have these meetings for all the people they came to the temple. It was the bigger structure. So that was used for this uh, Now, the problem with all of this beautiful liturgy, beautiful uh, ritualism, it was that worship becomes an end in itself. That's why all the prophets that you read they start denouncing. See, sometimes when I read this, the God says, I don't want any of your sacrifices. It made me sick, my stomach. And then, when I was younger, I was reading this. Well, I don't understand God. God commanded to have all this, you know, liturgy, all of the rituals, all the sacrifices. <clears throat> and then He said, I don't want this. Please. It's like dirty clothes. It's like uh, trash for me. So what was that God didn't like uh, this uh, sacrifice, this type of service? the intention, the attitude. See, they were worshiping God, they were bringing offerings, but 
There was a lot of corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think maybe this is happening in our churches right now? Mm -hmm. See, I praise God really, sincerely, for this worship institute. And I hope, we really, the thing that we learned here, that we can go back to our countries, to our churches, and share with them. But what will happen if this worship doesn't transform, doesn't become a way of life, a lifestyle? We'll be excellent musicians, excellent worshipers, but really our lives. See, we were coming in, in what about, about 25, 30% of the population are evangelical. 30%, there is like 11 million people in the country. Praise God. But you see, still we have a lot of crime, we see a lot of corruption, violence, uh, divorces, for example. So what's happening? The church is not really making an impact. Even we have maybe a beautiful service. So I think we need to pray that the worship will never will become like the worship uh, of the Israel people. It was just ritualism. Uh, they, they thought that they were worshiping God, and God said, please, I don't want this to be your worship. Um, then comes another institution, the synagogue. Who can tell me what was the origin of the synagogue, or how the synagogue came to existence? Remember, the temple was a huge structure. People came to worship God, instruments, sacrifices. So the synagogue, why the synagogue starts? It was during the time of the exile because there was no exactly. temple anymore. So they they were couldn't Babylon. take all their structure, they couldn't take all the orchestra. Remember, they were taking captives to all the countries. So they started this uh, more simple uh, service. Um, people read the scriptures in the synagogue, they still do, and they somehow interpret the scriptures. They pray, and remember the Shema we're talking about, the, the Deuteronomy, how do you say it again? The Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6 4. Listen, Israel, our God, is only one God, and they still recite. If you go to a synagogue, you will hear the Shema. Besides every Saturday when they meet. There were some instructions, some teaching in synagogue. So see, I will ask you the question. Our churches, do you think they resemble more a synagogue or more a temple? Mm -hmm. How do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well it depends on the church. It depends. If I go to a Episcopal church, a Catholic church, of course, you know, the priest will have a special role. We have candles, incense, in the mass. When the priests break the, the bread, you know, is that they're offering a sacrifice that they lose every time. So some denominations, some churches maybe are more closer to the temple. And other churches may be more free evangelical, there will be someone more the synagogue. For example, Baptist. I'm a Baptist, I come from a Baptist church. And for us, I was telling you the sermon is the most important part of the service. Sometimes people come to the church not really uh, to participate in communion. This is something that we celebrate every three months, every six months. Some Baptist churches only celebrate communion once a year. <laughs> and I know other churches, uh, the disciples of Christ, they do this every Sunday. How about your churches? Yes. Pretty every Sunday. Every month? Every month. Every month. Every month. Every month. Every Sunday we have every person yeah. turns on And what is your church? Independent church. Independent church. Yes. Twice Every day. Never? Every day. Oh, every day. Only yeah. bread. Wow. Only bread. Very interesting. No wine. Now, the Bible says how many times we're supposed to have communion. How many times? As often as you can. So, exactly. not limited. Yes. Every month. Every month. Every month. Every month. Do you go to church? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Hopefully, I think. In Catholic, they give every day, but of only priests, no wine. Even uh, nearly really? once also, they won't give All the wine. All the priests will have wine and bread, and yes. people just come for the priests will drink uh, wine and bread. That's not fair. Some they give the wine. Some they give the bread. Some they don't yeah. drink it. And for us, we do it two times. First and third Sundays. And oh, that's okay. where we have an okay. inflow of yeah. But I would say, in general, the evangelical church resembles more the synagogue. You know, because teaching is very important, the sermon is important, we sing, we pray, 
but we did not offer any sacrifices. See, that's why Catholics and other they burn incense. See, mm -hmm. that's a, a temple uh, practice. Anyway, uh, they read the Psalms, as uh, they were saying, they repeat the Ten Commandments, there was a benediction, there was an Amen. And this is a mother synagogue. Now, Jesus and worship. We, we come to the very crucial part of this stuff. What Jesus said about worship. What a worship practices. He did what he was living this earth. Did he go to the temple? Did he participate in the ceremonies? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. he did. Did he participate in the synagogue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Remember one time he came to a synagogue and people asked him to, we call it a preach, mm -hmm. to, to interpret the scripture. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was wonderful? We could be there when mm -hmm. Jesus himself will open the roads and he started reading on Isaiah. And he says, what he says here when he said, talking about Isaiah. So, and what is the religion, the church leaders did when they hear that? Ooh, God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How come, you know, how he dares to say that the, the scriptures are talking about him? Now, Jesus always referred to the temple as the house of my father. This is very, very important. So really, he didn't come, you know, to abolish temple practices. But, we learn in the scripture that for him teaching, see again, teaching to produce a change of life was very important for him. See? Not only participate in the ceremonies, the ritual, going like this, throw himself. Do you know I was reading the other day that Luther didn't abolish the idea of uh, going like this, crossing himself. I think he practiced it. That's why some Lutheran churches still they go like this. Catholics, of course. Uh, oh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And some of your churches, people, no. not crossing no. the no. 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 In the Episcopal, oh. yeah, I've seen that. Are there any Catholics in this room? I used to be. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so Jesus taught in the synagogues. Now, in uh, John chapter 20 is a crucial passage about worship. Let's do some. If you have Bibles, I need at least three persons that have Bibles. I want to dramatize the story. Please, can you come? You will be the Samaritan woman. <laughs> you have a Bible in you? Can you come here? You will be Jesus. <laughs> and then I need a narrator. Who wants to be the narrator? Okay, please. So she will be the narrator in John 4. You will be the Samaritan woman, and you will be Jesus. So she will start reading the story. Um, just, uh, John chapter 4. You can do this in your church. Maybe you have done this. Dramatize the scripture reading. It's so meaningful to people when they hear and they see. I lost my glasses. <laughs> That's why I couldn't see that. <laughs> okay, so you start reading John 4. Let's start um, Start in chapter 7. So you will read, when a Samaritan woman came to know what Jesus said to her, and then Jesus thought, and then when uh, the, the woman responds, then you read that. So this is like a, it's like a drama we're uh, improvising here. Okay. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. <coughs> Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you, given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well, well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us a well and drawn uh, from its earth himself? As did also his 
his sons and his blocks. Blocks, yes, blocks. Blocks. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I want to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I, I have no, no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but do you claim that, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem, Jerusalem? Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. We want to stop it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have you tried this in congregations? Try. Of course, you know it's better to rehearse, but it is so refreshing to you. We hear three people, you know, participating in the speaking meeting. Okay, so what was the problem with the Samaritan woman? That's the problem. She had a moral problem, right? Mm -hmm. She was living with so many women and Mary. But see, it's interesting. When Jesus and then the woman said, Oh, are you a prophet? How come you know all the things about my moral life? And see what happened after uh, Then Jesus said, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship with you. Well, the thing is, the Samaritans, remember, they have a different place to worship. The Jews, they uh, worship God in a different place. So the women start, you know, this discussion saying, well, really, we don't know where to worship. There's a controversy. But her problem was not really knowing where to worship. The problem was about a moral one. And then Jesus, what Jesus said, uh, yet a time is coming and it has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, <coughs> for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. See? For me, this is a wonderful concept we find here that God is seeking worshippers. See? We don't have, I'm glad that he came to this worship institute, but really, it's God that is seeking the worshippers. Now, people who worship him, how? Yes. With sound, with electronic instruments, hands up, hands down, dancing, not dancing. He's seeking for worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth, which means authentically, generally. That's the idea of this. So, I will say there are two classical passages for worship. One is in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6? Yes, Isaiah 6, remember? when he had this wonderful worship experience and he declared himself a sinner. The whole story is, is, is wonderful because when he confessed his sin, there's an angel, remember, to take a coal and purify Isaiah's lips. That's the idea of purification. And then, after this experience, God speaks. And then what is the response of Isaiah? Here I am, send me. See, that's the order of a service. Worship, praise, confession, justification. Uh, exactly. 
God's word to the sermon, and then we respond as a congregation. So we have this a format for worship. In the New Testament, a classical passage would be John 4. God is spirit. He is seeking true worshipers. It doesn't matter if you are Presbyterian, if you are Pentecostal, if you are royal. <coughs> really, God doesn't care about the name. Because he is seeking people who really worship God in any religion. You can be Catholic, you can be Calvinist, whatever. But if you are really worshiping God in the spirit and truth, God will be able to live this, this model and this person. Okay. The essence of a Christian religion is to love God and to love the neighbor, one another. This is really the essence of uh, the Christian faith. We won't have time you know, to do all the scriptures, but early Christians, they read the scriptures. Now, do they have, early Christians, do you think they have the whole Bible? Like we do? No. No. Well, and remember, the early Christians, they got letters from Paul, they got letters from James, and that's why they read to the services. One time, I went to a service, and the sermon, this is pastors, a creative idea. They read, for example, First Peter, like it was a letter. So someone wrote the letter in an envelope, I said, Pastor, you get a letter from the Apostle Peter. And he started reading. Oh, listen to what Peter wrote. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world. So he read the whole uh, epistle of Peter as a letter. And it was very meaningful because probably every Christian does the way that they listen. That was part of the service, but they were so glad to get a letter from Paul. No emails at that time, no text message. Mm -hmm. So probably it took months, you know, exactly, for a letter to arrive in the church. So that's why they did early Christian days and read the scripture. Some, they already have the Psalms, of course. They have the law. They pray. There are many uh, scripture references that prayer was a very important part of the service. Now, the Lord's Prayer. I know in some traditions they repeat the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm Baptist. I think this is the 99 times sensation. <laughs> <laughs> but I now you know uh, to introduce in services uh, tradition from other denominations. So when I was leading my church in Guatemala, I said, okay, let's, uh, let's pray. I said, using the Lord's Prayer. They almost discovered me, killed me, because they are becoming Catholic. Oh, the only Catholics, they repeat the Lord's Prayer. I said, I'm sorry, but it's in the Bible. If you don't like this, you don't <coughs> cut, you know, this <laughs> passage. Now, it's true, sometimes Catholics and all of them, they repeat, you know, like, for example, if you commit a sin, you go to the priest, and the priest will say, okay, now you have to say 100 uh, Lord's prayers. You know, ten, times, ten times Ave Maria, something like this. I think if we just repeat with no thinking, with, with no meaning, I think it's complete, the purpose is complete. But when we repeat the, the words of the Lord's Prayer, but we think, let, 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 let's repeat, let's pray the Lord's Prayer. But think. The, the Catholics, they do not um, um, recite yeah. the entire prayer of this time or a particular part. They do not go to the end. Some do. Oh, well, yeah. some, you, you're some talking do. about some editions don't say, uh, Dying is the kingdom and the mm -hmm. glory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's a part that there's some manuscript that they don't include this. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they think it's like an added doxology. But anyway, uh, I encourage you, well, you Reformed Church, do you repeat the Lord's Prayer every Sunday? No, every Sunday. Oh, okay. Occasionally. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday. We do it every Sunday. Oh, every Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for us, we, we recite it um, communion Sunday. Oh, okay. Other Sundays, we sing it out. I had about asking people, why is your understanding that we say, uh, Lord's Prayer is God, our Father, who art in heaven, what is the meaning of this? How would be like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I think if we have this question, maybe people will say the Lord's Prayer, but in a more meaningful way. Yeah. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Give us our daily bread. Do you have bread this morning? Mm -hmm. Pancake. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Whatever. So it should be seen as whatever you have to. It's food. And also, when we say give us our daily bread, we need to think about millions of people. Yeah. 
Cuba, kids that they need to decide, I'm going to have this bread for breakfast, I'm making this for snack in school. They demand this, making this decision every day. So there are millions of people. We were coming to Guinea, when we come from another country, at least I was shocked to see the abundance of food. For example, I'm staying in the Prince Center. How many of you stay in the Prince Center? Yeah. I never seen so much fruit in my life and so many cookies. <laughs> you know, here in America, you know, they always serve when my wife is American, we always fight each other. Her idea is that we should have like 10 times more food, you know, when we have guests. Another cultural difference, for example, <coughs> here in the States, you have to have three or four different types of cereal for breakfast. Right? So you will choose Cheerios, you will choose sugar free, you will choose. <laughs> in our country, we should be blessed and happy we have something to eat. So as I notice here for picnics, we have to have a cafe with free sugar, free light, you know, all kind of stuff. <laughs> so, well, praise God that we still have a super abundance of things, but in a lot of places in the world right now, people are dying because they don't have uh, so much to eat. So when we repeat or when we say the Lord's Prayer, we should be thinking and not just repeating it, you know, as a ritual. A uh, sermon was very important, and the early church, of course, exhortation. Admonition, offering. Remember, Paul. Paul was a missionary, so the congregation had to raise, you know, uh, funds for his ministry, and he was not ashamed to ask for money. Uh, early Christians, they have problems because they started. They were Jewish people, right? Early Christians. First Christians were Jewish, so they wanted to worship, worship God in the synagogue. And what happened? They say, go away, because they were teaching different uh, doctrines. Could they go to the temple? No. Now, early Christians start getting a fellowship, the koinonia. There's a meeting in homes. Now, have you been to a service in a home? I'm sure. In October, I had the opportunity to go to Spain. Spain is a very Catholic country. Zero. 0.5% are evangelicals in Spain. Seville, I was teaching a seminar there in Seville, and there is just one Baptist church, whole city of Seville. So I was invited uh, to be in a home church. Starting. And I'm sure in Cuba, I've read that there's a lot of home churches. There is no a lot of ritual, there is no a lot of uh, art, but really, uh, and I'm making this um, home. I really feel, and I thought that I was like in the early church. You know, people that were sitting in the living room. Mm -hmm. I think that is like, there's so hard to say all Catholics, there's no Protestant church. Oh, Catholic, very few, very few. Oh yeah, Catholic. But you know what is interesting? They claim they're Catholic, but they don't go to church. You know, in, in general in Europe, churches are used uh, for museums, for tourists. But really, everybody in Spain says, oh, you know, I'm Catholic, I was baptized. But they don't go to church, they don't read the Bible, they don't believe in Christians, like that. they are Catholics, they are Christians. So, uh, what I was saying that this is um, one of the modalities that early Christians have, they meet at home, you know, sometimes secretly. You know. That's why we don't read a lot of uh, use of instrumental music in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, yes, they use trumpets, cymbals, choirs, but in the early church, <laughs> If they were uh, meeting secretly, <coughs> if someone started playing the trumpet, the Roman soldiers would come and get even the trumpet player. You know? <laughs> so that's why we don't read a lot of uh, the use of music, instrumental music in every church. But the, the, for sure they met. They have a meal together. They read the, the, re the letters from the apostles and the gospel. They still some of the hymns, and some people were writing hymns. We have a lot of, uh, for example, if you read Ephesians 5, 19, <coughs> Paul talks about three forms of music. One is psalms. He said we should worship God, praise God, by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms are what we have in the Bible. I don't think nobody can write a new song, right? Because it's the, part of the inspired word of God. Hymns. So churches that are not singing hymns, are they following the New Testament? 
<laughs> now, for many years, I was teaching that hymns is what we have in the hymn book. Psalms is what we have in the Bible. And the spiritual songs, I've taught for many years, the spiritual songs are these colitos. Very short uh, songs. But they really more study a little more. Um, the word spiritual song is very controversial. Some people think the spiritual song were spontaneous expressions that some people in the congregation would have during the service. It's like speaking in tongues. Some in the congregation will stand up and, stand and start, yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. So this is a, a body, a body practice because it's biblical. Um, but anyway, Paul exhort us to use at least three forms music and services. So I think we can use it, why not? Now, what Yvette is doing, writing a new song, I will say, I consider this a spiritual song because what she wrote is a product of her own personal experience, right? It's not something that someone told you, oh, you need to write about this. Remember, she saw that her inspiration was a storm, she said, in Cuba, you know, very strong storm. And after the storm, she saw that she wrote it that God is our anchor you know, in the midst of the storm. So I will say, she didn't write a hymn. It's not considered a hymn. What is a hymn, by the way? What is the definition of a hymn? It's a Greek word. It's not a Christian invention. Greeks have hymns to gods like Apollo, to all these uh, Greek and Roman gods. They wrote hymns to their deities. Collection. Yeah. And the Christian, they adopted the Greek form and they started writing hymns to God, to Christ. Yeah, hymn is a Greek, it's a poetic form that usually is directed to God. And I always give the example, Silent Night. Silent Night. Oh, it is a hymn? Yes, it is. And it's directed to whom? <laughs> Who are we singing to when we sing Silent Night? So people say to the night. <laughs> yeah, some songs, you know, they're not really direct. One of my favorite songs is How Great the Art. Mm -hmm. yeah. The chorus is, Mi corazón entona la canción. Juan Grandese, Juan Grandese. Mi corazón entona la canción. Cuán grande es él, cuán grande es él. I think it sounds better in Spanish. Can you have some songs before we finish? Oh, sure, yeah. If you, can, you want to teach us a song? Okay. No, I, I, it says we closed it. Uh, yes, 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 yes. We're going to have a, a closing time, so which comes in the next five minutes. Yeah. 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 Now, can I go quickly? Mm -hmm. Can I go quickly to my last presentation because I just want to show you. I spent so much time doing the PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm not you this for all the But I want to show you some analogies that we can use to teach worship to our congregations. Um, See, I teach this course in a semester. So it's hard, you know, for me to try to summarize <laughs> in four hours. But let me go quickly to the, okay, this is what I meant. Okay, this is an, an analogy that one um, theologian from Sweden, I think he's from Sweden, oh, sorry. Ah. Okay. Um, can I show, I got to from the current slide. This one. And then I go slideshow and I go to current slide. Right? <coughs> okay. There's a theologian uh, by the name of Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard compared worship to a play. I think that's the name of Kierkegaard. And when I first time read this, I said, oh, he's crazy. How can you compare worship to God with a play? It's something you see in the theater. But then when I keep reading, I, I, I know this. In a play, we have an actor, right? Or actors. We have an audience. And sometimes behind, behind curtains, 
there is someone that is helping the actor to remember the lines. Mm -hmm. How do you call this in English? Prompters. Prompters, exactly. So keep it, well, keep it as it, in a theater, there are actors, audience, mm -hmm. and prompters. See, in some churches, people think that they're the audience. They just go to observe what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then the team, the worship leader, sometimes the pastor, he's the actor. He's the one who is doing everything. And even the way that your churches are built, that's why I love this chapel here comes. It's a circle. You know? But sometimes, you know, the platform the churches is so high. And the way that the curtains are, it's like a theater. <coughs> he said, it shouldn't be like this. Because when we worship God, who should be the actors? Everybody. Who should be the prompters? The worship leader, the pastor. And who should be the audience? Yo, God, God. Uh, what other language we can say God? How do you say God in your language? Chineke. Chineke. Oh, Chineke. He should be the audience. We're offering our worship to God, not to the people. One more analogy, then we quit. Oh, I love this. The sermon. In Mexico and other countries, when you have a Tito is laughing, or he did the same when he was young and boyfriend. When you have a girlfriend, you bring a, a group of friends playing guitars early in the morning or late at night, and then you come to your girlfriend and sing for her. Now, if she likes the music, she likes the guy, of course, you know, she will open the door, you know, and this is a sign, okay, I accept you know, that I'm my boyfriend. Yeah. But sometimes our surname to God is so loud. You know, we think that the louder, the more uh, lively it is, that God will answer us, you know. But when we think about, how about if the boyfriend, you know, the guy comes drunk and making all kinds of scandals and screaming? Do you think the girlfriend, you know, will open the windows? No, and the no. Oh, it's a crazy guy. I don't yeah. want to marry a, a drunk man, right? So this is another concept that not necessarily, because we're singing so loud, we're using so many instruments, God will listen to us. Because again, what God is doing is for a sincere heart. Okay. Thank you for your time. Now we want to finish with some songs, with mm -hmm. two or three minutes of songs. I'm really... Um, Grateful for this opportunity. Yes, you want to sing. Now, Carlos is not here, but can you, uh, can we go over one of the songs that Carlos wrote? Um, for me, it was a wonderful experience, you know, especially having people from all parts of the world. And I want to take a picture before we go. Okay, so don't leave me because I want to have a picture of my room. Uh, I never have so many people from different countries. Oh, yes. yes. So for me, this is exciting. Uh, praise God. For we were expecting Hispanic pastors. But God saying you, <laughs> I learned a lot from you. So, what is the song that we're going to sing? Okay, Señor. Okay, I'm I'm not really familiar with the song, but Tito and. Uh, We're going to sing, A ti, Señor, also mis ojos. I give my eyes to you, Lord.
No, we, we, they don't have the words for this dance. Okay, can you sing it, please? Uh, can you sing it? Yes. Let's see if I, if I, if I, if I miss. We will study that God accepts, you know, it's the attitude that counts. It's the attitude, yeah, because I don't have the it's voice. Not, I know. <laughs> okay, let's do that then. Uh, you have it, Edgar. <laughs> okay. I only have the first page. Yeah, that, that's what we did. You can just finish singing it in English. Okay, okay. Let's sing in English. I will lift my eyes. Ready? I will lift my eyes. I will lift my eyes. We finish at 3.15, right? Yeah. Or 3.30? Yeah. It's okay. Oh! Can you remind us the... Yeah! The, the See, I know we finish... Yeah. All of them. Just uh, oh. so that we won't forget uh, how to Very good. Sing. And Carlos, do you think you can provide them with the music? Yes, of course, yeah. Some people, I gave her a yeah. yeah. Do you see how I, you have my email address in there? Yeah. That was the intention, that if, you, if there is a song in there that you want, you know, I'd be happy to send you the, the, the score for it. Uh, and same with event. Yeah, same with event, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, um, we're, we're going to probably record, uh, I want to do a, rec a, a CD of, of bilingual songs, and so, um, so this, these are going to be in the list. Yeah. Um, I, I want to just briefly to pray for my country, Nigeria. Yeah. 
recently um, reading the news and find out we have some terrorists uh, what country uh, Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria the northern part of Nigeria is having some crisis some bombings and all that attacks is there any persecution uh, yeah, yeah especially Christians are just targeting churches because of this the, the terrorists are from the Muslim sect See, we take this for granted. You know, here we can choose any church we want to go. We can watch uh, Christian programs on TV. But a lot of countries, this is illegal. Mm -hmm. So we need to pray for persecution. I came uh, because uh, uh, there is a Hispanic community that comes uh, regularly to our church, mm -hmm. to which uh, I want to encourage our church to reach out and and really, you have an inspiration to me <coughs> because you're not being Hispanic, you're so interested, you're not being Hispanic, you're being completely another country. So really, this is something that we need to think of for people like me, and we, we need more people like me to be good. Hispanic, tomorrow I'm giving a workshop on uh, Hispanic practices, and I want, I want to show some statistics. There are almost 50 million Hispanics now in, living in the United States. 50 million. What time is it? Uh, um, I, it's a, what time? I, uh, worship is uh, C6. I remember this. It's 2.30 to 3.30. It's 2.30? Okay. Yes. 2.30 to 3.30. <coughs> yes. And I'm going Which to... Which number? Do you know? Six. Six. C6. Six. I remember C6. this. I don't know the room number. This is no room number. This is the workshop number. Mm -hmm. So I'll be talking about the um, Hispanic population. How can we minister more effectively? See, this seminar was like worship in general, worship principles. But tomorrow we'll be talking specifically, specifically about the Hispanics, some of the cultures, you know, the uh, traits like being late. <laughs> Family is very important for Hispanics. Uh, embracing each other, kissing. Well, in every culture, the kiss, that is in the culture, uh, Latin American culture, even if you really don't know a person well, you will kiss. Mm. And you know, some angles of people from other countries will find this offensive. Yeah. So we're going to find, uh, talk about all of these cultural differences, <laughs> and how these cultural differences affect the worship practices. So if you're interested, you're more welcome to come to my worship. It's only one hour. Do we, do we have to register before that? Do you know that? No, I think you just come. Okay, let's stand up and then we're going to have a little prayer, especially praying for Nigeria from India yeah. and for your ministry. You're talking about Grand Rapids, Michigan? Oh, my church. Here? Yeah. Okay. Please pray for my wife. Too. Yes, well, maybe Carlos is going to share with him. I'm going to pray to pray especially for Susan, his wife. Can I share with them? Mm -hmm. Chemotherapy, treatment, mm -hmm. and yes. so he has two beautiful children, two girls, we're going to pay for them. Yeah, she was diagnosed with this before. Someone else that needs to be responding what's the treatment of the students. Susan, what's her name? Susan. Someone else? Okay. Father, we pray also for the rest of this workshop. It really will be a blessing and their lives will be transformed. And when we go back to our churches, homes, that will be refreshed, new energy for service. So let's pray for that. Shower prayer. And so we are God that we've gathered this evening. We have gathered, Lord, in your presence to bless you. To bless you, God, because you are a big God. To bless you because you are great. To bless you, Lord, because you are above all gods. And so as we've gathered, Lord, we pray that you will look down upon us and have mercy. We pray, dear Father, that you individually look at us and forgive us of all of our sins, O oh God, that we have committed against you from time to time, knownly and unknownly, O oh God. We ask for forgiveness. We pray, dear Father, that as we go through this time, dear Lord, you you will lead us, you will guide us, you will teach us. You will endow us, O oh God, with wisdom, with knowledge, 
with courage and endurance, with understanding, dear Father, even those, O oh God, that are lecturing us, you will endow them, O oh God, with wisdom, with knowledge and strength, O oh God. We pray, dear God, that you will bless this college, this institution, Lord. We pray, dear Father, that all of its members, the entire staff, Lord, the, 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 the planning committee, Lord, dear Father, you will bless them. What we have started may end, O oh God, to the glorification of your name. All of us in this room, dear Father, all of the separate rooms around this campus, dear God, each member, O oh God, the lecturers, the, the participants, dear Father, those that cook the food, we pray you bless us individually. We thank you. Dear God, all of us that are participating from around the world, we commit our countries to you, O oh God. Especially so, Lord, dear Father, Nigeria and other countries, dear God, that have problems with terrorism, we pray breaking those bonds, O oh God. We commit everything into your hands and we pray, Lord, that you, O oh God, will put a halt to whatever it is. We pray, dear God, coming against the trick and plans of the evil ones, O oh God. We break the power in the name of Jesus. We know, dear God, that you have given us the power to pull down, to uproot, to break, and to scatter the powers of the enemies. And so, dear God, we stand here today as a family. We stand here today, oh God, as a nation. We stand here today, dear God, individually, Lord, but as a member of your body. And we pray, oh God, coming against every terrorism act, oh God, in Nigeria. Not only Nigeria, they are part of all of these countries, oh God, around the world yes. that have problems, oh God. Yes. We pray, Lord, yes. that you will intervene. Amen. We, in a special way, dear Father, want to commit Christians around the world that have problems with worshiping, oh God. We pray, dear God, that you will guide them, you will protect them from the enemies. We want to thank you in a special way for our brother whose wife has gone um, to the hospital. We pray, Lord, that you will stretch forth your healing hands. Amen. You are the yes. only doctor of your father. And what you say will happen, Lord, no man can say no to it, O oh God. Yes, and so whatever the devil has planned against us, dear Father, yes, we come against it with the blood of Jesus. Amen. We pray, dear God, that you are the doctor of all doctors. Yes. You the doctor of all doctors, oh dear yes, God. Master. You will work, dear Father. You will move, oh dear God. Wherever she has been, dear Father, you will stretch for your healing hands, oh God. Even the doctors, dear God, may they look up to you for guidance. May they look up to you for whichever direction to put the stitches, oh God. Whichever direction to put the scissors, oh God. Whichever direction to inject the needles, dear Father. What type of medicine to, to administer, oh God. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to them. Every trick and place of the evil ones, Lord, against his family, we come against them for the blood. Yes. All of us here, dear Father, our family, Lord, we travel from afar. What is going on back home, we don't know. Yes. But we ask, Lord, that you will take full control of dear God. Yes, Lord. Destroying the plans of the enemy. Mm -hmm. We ask, dear Father, that as we go through this time, Lord, we are to come back this evening. You bring us safely. As we ride the buses to go, Lord, you be the driver. Dear Father, you, you, you carry us safely and bring us back safely, oh God. Even to the end of this program on Saturday, Saturday, Lord, we pray that you will continue to lead, guide, and direct our steps, oh dear Father. We come against the place of the enemy and King, oh dear Jesus. We want to thank you for our lecturer, dear Father. We pray you bless him in a special way. He and his family, Lord, his children, his wife, we pray you bless them. Our dear Cuban sister over there, dear Father, we commit her into your hands in a special way. We pray that you continue to endow her with wisdom, O oh God. We pray, dear Father, that you continue to give her knowledge, Lord, and understanding in your words. That, Lord, her songs she's writing, Lord, will go worldwide and will bring changes and life to many souls that are lost, O oh God. We want to thank you for financial assistance. We thank you for great breakthrough in our life. We thank you, dear Father, for everything, O oh God. And what more can we say? We do not say we praise you and that we love you. And so we want to give you thanks. As we depart, your Father, we are not departing your presence. We ask that you go with us. Whatever we put our hands to do, Lord, may it prosper. Wherever we lay our hand, Lord, may it be sound. Whatever we put our feet to, Lord, here, Jesus, may it carry blessings, O oh God. 
Dear Father, whenever we speak to Dear Father, may we give life. We thank you. We give you glory and honor now in Jesus' name. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Before you go, I'm going to take a picture.